Hello everybody, thank you for tuning in. The subject of today's interrogation is my good friend John Kreshmer. John's been sailing for more than 40 years and in that time he's amassed 300,000 miles in more than 60 boats, doing a thousand miles apiece in each of those boats. Among his many sailing accomplishments, uh, he has doubled the horn in a Contessa 32 called Gigi, which was the subject of his first book. Since then, John has written an additional six books chronicling his seafaring adventures around the world. He now spends his days with his wife Taji aboard their Kaufman 47 named Quetzal doing training passages and seminars all around the world. If you want to find more information about John or any of his books, you can catch him at johnkreshmersailing.com. Without any further ado, please enjoy this vast and far-reaching conversation with my friend, John Kreshmer. <laughs> All right. Taji, would you get my Cuban, uh, my Che hat? <laughs> <laughs> Penny just a little uh, less long the other day. Shake around. Uh, uh, viva. Uh, viva la revolution. Viva la revolution. Okay. Mm. All right. <laughs> Everything's rolling? Yep. So, a great many of our viewers are familiar with you, but for the, for the benefit of those who perhaps aren't familiar with you, John, um, could you give us a, a brief summary of your sailing resume thus far? Perhaps how, <laughs> how does someone go from not sailing um, to 300,000 miles and what? 30, 40 years? Yeah, well, thanks. And I like the thus far comment. Thus far. <laughs> yeah, still kicking. Um, you know, I was not someone who grew up sailing dinghies or even grew up around the water. I, it's weird. I kind of fell in love with sailing through books. I was a kid who grew up in Detroit, and I became enchanted with the whole idea of these these single-handed adventurers. I read of Motessier, and I read Chichester, and I read about the... Uh, Oh, Vito Dumas was my favorite, this Argentinian who'd sailed around the world during, in between the Great Wars, and I was just really fired up by these things, but I didn't even know how to sail. And uh, it turned out that I was a, a less than stellar collegiate uh, student, <laughs> and I finally dropped out for the last time, and my mom and I made a deal. She said, if, if you work hard for six months, whatever you make, I'll match, provided you buy a little boat and take off, because it's all you ever talk about. And so she was a she was a avid sailor already. She was not. She had she never sailed at all. So what do you feel prompted her to, to give you that? She and deal? I were kindred souls. She knew exactly what was making me tick, and she would have loved to have had that same opportunity oh, in her books. life. Fair enough. Yeah, and she was, you know, she was a child of the Depression in the states, and then World War II, and just kind of got swept into adulthood and motherhood. And she would have loved to have had an adventurous life if she could have. And she ended up. As you know, sailing around the world. That's right. When I, ta she, I taught her to sail when she was sixty. So you, <clears throat> you started, and then you told, taught her, and then she went and and, and then and, she carried on around. I mean, her yeah. story sounds book worthy. Oh, itself. her story is a she's a remarkable person. That's fantastic. Yeah. So, so what? I don't know if you were, you probably don't remember, but <laughs> what prompts someone? I mean, sailing literature is. It's a. You got you either love it, love it or you hate it. Yeah. And, and as someone who's tried to get it's... Kiara to read the Patrick O'Brien, <laughs> she didn't even like, six pages in. Like, it's not funny. Uh, yeah. That's so what prompts thick. someone who's not a sailor, never never sailed, or, mm. or not just, right. total green on to pick up a whatever book it was, the mm. first book? I think for on. me it was a lot of things. One was that I was keen on adventure you know before i was interested in sailing i wanted to be a great hiker or backpacker and at age 13 i tried to become the youngest kid to ever hike this hiking trail in michigan <laughs> and failed miserably but it was kind of in my dna this idea of adventure and i just really i was developing as a kid this weird philosophy of self-reliance and wanting to test myself against what seemed to be the dispassionate whims of nature. I, I didn't want to, I'd been in competitive sports for my entire life as a kid and I was really sick of that. And I love the idea of putting myself out there kind of in nature and I was a student of Thoreau and the transcendentalism and all that sort of crap. And then, I, and sailing just seemed like a really natural way to be able to yeah. find yourself and in a really true place. And it turned out to be true. <laughs> I feel like I actually I'm having a bit of a moment. Like, like what are you saying? I'm like, oh, it rings very familiar. Yeah, I can believe it. Well, you know, honestly, I think that's where we become good friends. Is I saw a lot of you in me when we met last year. Mm. I mean, 
Yeah, I would agree with that. I'm yeah. so, certainly not anywhere near as well read, but I'm working on it. <laughs> uh, but I definitely agree with the, um, the yeah, adventures. You're adventure. always looking for a new way. To... And you were never looking for the easy way. That's the thing I like best about you right from the get-go. Is that... <laughs> no, seriously, you accepted the responsibility oh, of being out here. It was never like you were dropping out. You were clearly dropping in. And mm. that was... that was. I mean, remember telling Taji that. You know, I just... I felt that was super cool because you were very very sure you know wanted to get things right and wanted to learn and wanted to expand what you knew and it yeah. wasn't like you were on a holiday that you were going to just hang it up one day and go home really. <laughs> it yeah, didn't seem like it we'll see <laughs> still working on my partner in crime yeah so you, you've got you've got the bug your mom's given you this ult ultimatum mm. and i obviously i know she's come through with the goods and you yeah. ended up getting a boat so i bought this little 27 foot boat and it had no engine, and I'd run out of time in Michigan, so I had just enough money left to ship it down to Florida. And I just picked an address out of the yellow pages, <laughs> those, those ancient documents that we used to have. And it landed on the Miami River, and I went down and got it in the water, and I didn't know there were seven bridges between the boatyard and the bay. So I literally would like mm. sail the river and sail right up to a bridge. I had no radio, and I would go, hey, hey, I need you to open the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> just keep tacking back and forth from the or bridge. grab a hold of the ball guy. Uh, this is where the heaving two practice began. <laughs> this is, no, I right, it was a natural. <laughs> but anyway, I finally made it out into the bay, and yeah, that was kind of the start. Yeah, and I never really looked back. I was con mm. even though it was crazy. I went aground on every sandbar between Miami and Key West, and <laughs> but I was gathering my way, and that's why I was honest. I don't mean to be stoking at all, but the. The idea that this is a process of learning, um, and you you can read about it till the manatees come home, but until you actually get out there and do it, it doesn't really yeah you know, translate. And I I agree. Yeah, and, and it you've you've I want to finish your story because um, like I said, I view I want our viewers to to fully understand who who I'm talking to right now. Um, but off the back of that, uh, there's a lot of discussion, and this is one of my questions. There's a lot of discussion about um, qualifications versus experience, and, and and in particular, particularly online. And I feel like it's a bit of a badge of honor that's bandied around. Mm. I, I don't know the, I don't even know the numbers. It's one of one of one, one of three, yeah, two, two three, four AM, ASA sailing yeah. courses. And, yeah. What are your thoughts on, on that? And do you feel it's? I mean, I, no one questions the validity of them, but often I feel, uh, as much as they are a boon to someone's experience, they're also a bit of a, uh, a paralysis by analysis kind of thing where you you feel you need them before mm -hmm. you can go you know so i have a these days as people probably know we run training passages on mm -hmm. Kitsall, and i have people of incredible variety of experience come mm -hmm. aboard and some have taken all the saf courses and the u.s sailing courses and others have taken none what i find is that the people who are really into the courses are groping for knowledge in one way and they're but they still have this recognition that they haven't maybe tallied the, the experience they need mm. um so in my universe the people that come sailing with me are really open to experience and want to learn it is a little tough when some guy has done a lot of you know sort of maybe it's lake sailing or whatever and, and lake sailors often are great sailors because mm -hmm. the wind's so shifty but then they start to pontificate about what you're doing right or wrong right and yeah. you know the more i sail the less i think i'm sure that i know and it's really interesting to me because the more people that come onto my boats whether they sail on kentucky lake or in norway they always show me something i didn't know before mm -hmm. and I know that sounds really schmaltzy and, you know, like the kind of thing you're supposed to say, but it's absolutely been true. And so it's, I think sailors in general are really open to learning and the ones that aren't, you just kind of push by the side because those that think they know more than they, than everybody else, they're, they're just bores and nobody really wants to sail with them. And then more than, more often than not, I find at home, at, <laughs> at the computer, exactly. not out here. I don't think yeah. I've ever met someone who, who... I agree. I've completely. had debates. I've had he uh, heated debates oh, about sailing, yeah, but it's for never sure. been adversarial. Right. Whereas you take 15 minutes of any question online about sailing, and it, it oh, almost yeah. immediately yeah. adversarial. Yeah. Uh, and it just dissolves from. Yeah. There. You know, um, I kind of skate along in that world. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I write my books, and they're they're easier to hide behind than in your world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Mm. Mm. So you're uh, so you've got the boat now. So tell me about the jump from uh, sailing your first boat to Gigi. So it was a weird jump because in those days it'll seem really old fashioned, but and it's and it's interesting. This subject I'm about to mention is making a great comeback, but. The key to being a sailor in those days was to learn to celestial navigate. So sailing itself was important, but navigation was everything. There was no other way to cross an ocean but with your sextant. And so I was determined to learn it and just butted my head like I learned everything, just kind of a self-taught, autodidactic person. And I just kept working and working and working and became pretty good at it. Mm. And I opened up, because I didn't know anything else, and I was completely broke, a little school to teach celestial navigation. And one of my students was this guy from Detroit. And um, he wanted to buy a boat in England because the U.S. dollar was really strong then. And he kind of hired me to be the skipper, which was a job I was woefully unqualified (laughs) for, but accepted all the same. And then Ty and I crossed the Atlantic, and I talked him into using Gigi for the great Cape Horn trip the next year and that was the game changer for me and that was kind of your way of following in the footsteps of your heroes that was the it, books. exactly yeah, yeah. yeah. I, i've right. written before and i joke you know i went to to school at at harvard south off cape horn <laughs> <laughs> but it was that was and i was really appreciative of what i was doing yeah. learning on the fly mm-hmm. second by second mm-hmm. and because of that trip it's one of the reasons why i'm very patient and tolerant with people who seem to be launching dreams they're not totally prepared for. Mm -hmm. Because based on the standards of what I was prepared for, no one should have said I should have done Cape Horn. And so I always try to keep that in mind. You know, when you become the expert and you have all the answers and all the experience, you have to wade back to where you started. And snuffing out somebody's dream is way, way more damaging than yelling at them for tying the wrong kind of knot or whatever. And so... Yeah, I know Ty, this guy, Ty Tachero was his name. Was a, he was a difficult guy in a lot of ways. And But when I look back at the arc of my life, the two great influences were Ty and my mom. Right. My mom always gave me opportunity, and Ty gave me opportunity, but tested me. He always put my ass on the line. <laughs> and it was really good training. Everybody needs one person like that. <laughs> exactly. Just, you know. I would never pull that whole thing off without him. I was ready to quit several times. And, really? Yeah, and he okay. kept me going. So were were you the driving factor in that trip? And Ty was along for the ride? Completely or from a, a sail. No, from a sailing standpoint, absolutely. I mean, and Ty recognized that for sure. Ty was a really savvy guy. He realized that I had the sort of the knowledge and, and the physical skills to pull it together, and he loved being part of it. And he recognized we needed each other. I think it took me a longer time to realize how much I needed him. Right. You know, the hubris of youth where you just feel indestructible. And But looking back at it now, I many times I was just really beat down and Ty would lift us up and keep me going. And oh, okay. So yeah, I'm, one I'm of my regrets spirit. maybe is that I didn't give Ty more credit when it would have mattered more. But okay. he and I are great friends to this day. And Yeah. Yeah. So, Fantastic. yeah, I look back. It's... Yeah, you, know, you got to give younger people time. <laughs> Absolutely. 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 So when you were departing, I'm, I'm seeing an opportunity here because this question was posed to me the oh, other day nice. about risk. Right. Um, I, I think I was there. I think you were there. <laughs> um, so, so as a, I'm trying to record the question directly. As a self-professed amateur, I think was the word. Uh, do you? How do you? Man- how did you manage? How do you compensate? How did you? rationalize the risk of that journey for me it was again i think i you know the two great loves in my life besides my beautiful wife taji but the things have been boats and books and i was really grounded in it sounds silly but kind of in a philosophy that is this weird mix of existentialism and stoicism and yet being really optimistic about Mm -hmm. the world I, i always had a view that each day had a lot of power to it and if you wasted it you were losing that day. And I guess it was caused by my father dying when I was 16, which really, really mm-hmm. just threw my life sideways and was the probably the big event in my life that made me choose the life I've lived. But I never saw the risk as a detriment. I always saw the risk, believe it or not, I know this sounds stupid, but I always saw the risk as kind of a positive mm-hmm. in that it, it 
brought me, re it made me very alive. It put me on, the, the, my senses were totally on edge. And I wasn't a, like some crazy swinging off a cliff kind of risk taker. It was a very well thought out thing. But within the premise of what the trip meant, the risk was, was a huge part of why I did it. Hmm. And that's what I wanted to tell Steve is that the risk is a motivating factor. It was for me. It's part of the reward. It's it? a huge part if of the reward. If there was no risk, you would have, have achieved nothing. You would have arrival. achieved nothing. I know. And it, you don't want to sound like some macho jerk. Blah, no. blah, blah. But no. at the same time, I love the whole notion that the deck edge of your boat is your world and you're hmm. responsible for all that. And as predicted, we did not get past the first question. <laughs> you know, I, got one. I got one. He got another I one. I squeezed one in in the middle of the first story. I'm sorry. So you were telling us about um, how you managed the, how your how your philosophy allowed mm. you to to I guess manage or rationalize the risk going into your adventure around the Cape Horn the first time. Well, not the first so time, the yeah, and it, time. yeah, but it was. For me, it almost felt, and, and this is kind of that, that urgency that you feel when you're young, but it almost felt after the death of my father. And then on top of that, my sister got breast cancer at 23 and died a few years later. Oh, so, I knew that. so I had this real urgency to live my life. And, and I know that is almost cliche-like, but it meant everything to me. And it seemed a greater risk not to do it. I and said that to that guy. The other you day. did, and I love that because I was thinking as I was thinking about today, I was I was going to use that line because if you, the greater risk is just letting every all the time slip away. And one day you wake up and what have I been doing for forty years? And it's interesting years. in my business now because I have these amazing people who come sail with me, but every now and then someone comes who realizes he or she has waited too long. So you've given me the perfect opportunity. I had, it, <laughs> I had this for later, but yeah, I, I want to. I want to talk about it. So you have. Uh, could you could you tell us about your? Uh, I think it's eighty year guarantee. <laughs> your proposition. So you have all these crews come on and your training passages, and I've, we've discussed this before. But I think it's a great question. I'd yeah. love. I'd love for everyone to ask their, <laughs> the, the their hypothetical. friends and family oh, the hypothetical boy. question. Yeah, this is tricky. So so could you tell us what your so, question is? One of the great things about our passages is that no matter what the weather. At some point, usually around 5 o'clock, we gather in the cockpit and we have captain's hour. And probably half the people actually have a drink, some don't. But it's a time when there's great community. And I always ask these annoying hypothetical questions. And one of them is, the one that is really stuck and really causes a lot of debate, is if you could, and, it, you know, and it, it's kind of a Faustian bargain, I, I get it. But if you could dial in right now on that watch at captain's hour the age 78, and know that you would live in perfect health, you'd age, but you wouldn't even have an ache or pain right up to that moment, and then call it a day. Mm -hmm. Would you take that deal if you could s sign on the dotted line, or would you trade off for the hope of a longer life, or shorter, uh -huh. or the risk of getting sick or feeling lousy? Mm. And it is very interesting. I would say... 60% take the deal. 60? Okay. Of course, as they get closer... <laughs> so there's got to be an age correlation there, right? There is yeah. sometimes, but they're always, they're, sometimes it, there isn't. Um, yes, mm. I mean, the few 70-year-olds take the deal. Of course. Most younger people take the deal. Very few 79-year-olds <laughs> take the deal. <laughs> exactly. Not one as yet. <laughs> but it is really it really points to that whole idea of not yeah. wasting your time. I mean, yeah, and, time is the currency of our life and absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great writer Annie Dillard, she has such a simple quote that how we live our days is of course how we live our life and the days count. They matter. And you know, I'm 61 now and going strong, but I've got great aspirations and hopes, but yeah, I mean, if I if I choked on this carob during this interview and called it a day, it'd be sad. Todd, you'd be sad. I think my kids would be, but I'd be. What a way to go! Pretty happy, to, you know. Exactly, it'd be a story right to the end. <laughs> he died as he lived. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So mm. you you mentioned in that story, uh, Captain's Out. Yes. That's a controversial. I got, no, that's fantastic. I'm, I, I, uh, I, I'm. I'm waiting for you to choke on your caribs so I can inherit it and be like, oh, yeah, I am my, the king of Captain My good Zara. friend, long-time mentor, <laughs> right. pass this on. <laughs> Captain's <laughs> hour has to happen can now. I leave it's this. a millennial falcon tradition. 
but I can't have it yet because it's yours. <laughs> so how did I'm that come about? Fast, did you inherit that from someone else, or did you? You know, it was Ty. It was Ty again. All right. Okay. So we were too young. I mean, all young. I was twenty-two. He was forty-two or forty, forty or something. And we were these two guys from the Midwest, just totally out of our element. First in the Atlantic, then in the Southern Ocean, in this little tiny boat. I mean, a Contessa 32 has less freeboard than this settee does to the soul, and you're just getting douched all the time. And it, the, the, old, the ocean kind of felt like a wilderness at times, and Captain's Hour was this place where we restored our humanity, and we had no refrigeration and very limited fresh water, so we would have gin, if I was making it, or if he was making it, vodka, and tang. And a few little slips of water to stir the tang up, <laughs> and we had tangos, and they were they became a staple of our passages. Mm -hmm. And I learned from that. And then as the years went by, I've sailed with lots of interesting people, and you know, there's there's controversy about whether anybody should drink underway. And through forty years of this madness, there's never been anybody who got toasted underway that. I mean, yeah. there's a sense of survival that takes place and a responsibility and but I think a drink here or there helps people sleep mm -hmm. it allows them to relax a little bit and probably half the people don't drink at all it doesn't mm -hmm. doesn't really implicate or, or, or define captain's hour it's more the humanity of it no I think that, <clears throat> I, yeah I think it's fantastic mm -hmm. and it's a great opportunity to bring everyone together and yeah so you uh, <laughs> so you you've you made it around the horn made it around Obviously. the horn and then we had our 15 minutes of fame in San Francisco. Where did you go after the horn? Where did you make land? F was there? A, is, it, so the, the, is it a thing? Like, yeah, we went to fair for getting around the so horn. The way we did it, and, and the, what made the trip noteworthy, it seems a little maybe out of date now, but is we sailed from New York to San Francisco. And we did it in stages only because we were such a small boat. But we were duplicating the route that America's clipper ships took. Right. And so it was kind of a historic trip. And for those who are not familiar with that, could you give us a... Yeah, so in the middle of the, eight, the 1840s to th early into the 1850s, it was this little window of time. Mm -hmm. America and England created these this class of ships that were called clippers because they clipped along. And they were they were woefully impractical, absolutely beautiful. And they had two purposes. The English ships were called the tea clippers because they would race to China to get the freshest tea and then race all the way back and go around the world via the horn. And to arrive, if you arrived a week before your 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 competitor, your tea was more valuable. Right. And Cuddy Sark was one of those. Mm -hmm. The American clippers were to take prospectors, people really hungry to make their fortune from East Coast ports around the horn to San Francisco so they could get to the gold fields in San Francisco and North, and they were called the Gold Rush Clippers. Right. And they were, I mean, they recorded speeds over 20 knots all the time. They made epic 300-mile-day passages. 300-mile-day passages. Yeah, but the route was tough Ooh. for them because the American Clippers had to go south, around South America, and then upwind around the Horn, mm -hmm. and then north to San Francisco. So the route was primarily to windward. Right. And the phrase was called doubling the horn. If you can picture South America and it just kind of nibbles south facing toward Antarctica, mm -hmm. Cape Horn's at about 56 or 57 degrees. The 50th parallel kind of runs through Patagonia and Tierra del Fuego. Mm -hmm. So to sail from 50 south on the Atlantic to 50 south on the Pacific, right. that was the big deal, doubling the horn. You okay. couldn't stop. You couldn't go into Ushuaia and the Beagle Channel. You just stood out there and got blasted. And that's what we did in Gigi. So we became, we think, the smallest boat to double the horn. Wow. And I think we were the first American yachtsman to ever do. There were a lot of stupid little things we were trying to achieve. But mm. when you're south of Cape Horn, you realize what nonsense any of that is. We just, <laughs> just straight up stand on the, on yeah, the boat exactly. trying, to, trying yeah. to make it. You've come around the horn. And then you, where did you let make landfall? So we, we made landfall in Chile, in Valparaiso. And then we were there for just a bit and carried on to San Francisco. Right. And that was the conclusion of it. And then that was sort of, a, I had my 15 minutes of fame there. I went on TV shows and lots of funny stories about what a, what a joke that was. and what these, In what way? Like, Oh, it's, they're funny stories for some of the, the, the crowd. Some of your American listeners will, will get a kick out of them. I went on... 
TV show with Dan Rather. For objectivity, accuracy, reliability, watch the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather. Who was a famous TV person, and he, he kept calling me Don instead of John. And, oh, wow. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, that's and then I went on this show with <laughs> Joyce Brothers and Richard Simmons, and they'll know who this is. And Well, I can put the men in your audience, their uh, worries to rest. Just the whole thing was kind of chaotic, and I was happy to be released back into my world of just wanting to sail. But yeah. So after that, I wrote this book, Cape Horn of Starboard, mm -hmm. and realized, you know, there was hardly anything I actually knew how to do that I could get a job in the world. I could celestial navigate and sail. <laughs> yeah. So I became a, a niche skill yeah, there, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I became a delivery skipper, and for the next really 15 well, close to 20 years i just delivered sailboats all over the world and that's really where i learned my trade right um i delivered you know I, at one time i think i calculated and i may be wrong but it was like 60 different boats hmm. at least a thousand miles non-stop at one point 60 so. different boats a thousand <laughs> miles non-stop yeah so I you mean, have a very decent yeah, on a so huge whack of boats. I, that's where I learned all yeah, this about boats. It was just, not that I was some student of it, I was just delivering boats. That's how I made my living. I loved it. Well, yeah. one year we did five transatlantics and a delivery to Japan. I mean, from wow. Lauderdale. We were just tracking miles and... That's pretty yeah. cool. I mean, that's the way to do it, I suppose. Yeah, and then you gave the keys back and went home. It was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> not my boat, not my not circus, my, yeah, not exactly. my monkeys. I'm yeah. out of here. <laughs> yeah, it was a good Fantastic. life. I loved it. And how did that revol uh, evolve, rather, into the riding and the... Was it the... Like you said, you got so 60 boats. Yeah. Which obviously puts you in a very good position to... To write about boats, boats, for sure. Yeah, and that... Yeah, for sure. And then... But, you know, for me, like I said earlier books and boats have always been joined and mm. so I had visions of writing from a young age I remember telling my my high school career counselor or whatever you know what are you going to do with your life she said well I'm going to I'm going to have sailing adventures and write books about it and she just shook her head like oh my god <laughs> get real dude <laughs> but so I wanted to write and then the Cape Horn trip allowed me to write that book which was pretty forgettable at the time, and it's really interesting. I mean, a little self-promotion here, but I just looked the other day. So it ended up getting reprinted in this classics vision version, and then it's recently come out as an audio book, and it's often like the number one selling sailing book on Amazon again. I, all these I, years I later. sampled the audio book the other day. Story. Sailing. Yeah, and it came like up. Third on the list. Bang. Crazy. Yeah, so it's cool. The story lingers, and, and oh. then other books followed. And I was like, who's that strange man with all the hair on <laughs> All the that hair. <laughs> <laughs> you know, exactly. That beard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Taji has a picture. Man. She has a picture of that over her bunk. Oh. <laughs> <Nice>. Oops. Oops. <laughs> so you, uh, what prompted you to make the transition from delivery captaining, which my understanding is a pretty good living yeah to i love the life i mean you don't make that much money but man it's a great life you, yeah yeah you really feel free yeah i can imagine yeah, yeah. uh to to what you do to, like what, what's the sequence of events from there There's to here two things nariana and annika i had kids <laughs> with a former wife and um it just turned out the way the cards went was that i did a lot of the kid rearing um and Really enjoyed it. Totally surprised myself how much I just dug having these little creatures in my world. And so I had to create a way to continue to make a living, but in a more scheduled way. Oh, okay. So the whole, the whole, it wasn't like I had some great epiphany that I was going to share what I knew and mm -hmm. teach people to sail. I had to figure out how to keep sailing and keep getting paid for it, but right. on a very scheduled time frame. So that I could say, ah, oh, the kids will be on, and, you know, with their mother now. The kids will be here. And, mm -hmm. and so it literally was my daughters who prompted me to get into this business or was my incentive. And it's turned out fantastic, really. Would you say you were, um, was your, obviously you're a very good teacher um, now. Was that always the case? Was it something you've developed over time? Or you've Definitely developed over time. I had one... I was telling the guys in the in the workshop that just finished up, though, I, I really had three attributes that have made my life as a sailor good. One is I'm extremely patient. 
and always have been. Mm -hmm. So I kind of I can let somebody jibe five different times before I start <laughs> to holler at them, and that's a really good skill for this business of mine. Yeah. And secondly, I'm, I have a really high misery index, <laughs> and I can cook in any weather. And those are the three That's keys to my life. <laughs> I think you answered one of my questions there. Actually. <laughs> but no, it's a uh, yeah. No, you get better at it for sure. <laughs> one chap actually uh, was a little concerned with my salty language and. He would leave me little biblical messages <clears throat> under my pillow on my bunk. Your salty language. <laughs> my salty <What>? language. <laughs> but, no, in general, you know, I realized I made a great discovery. And I made it not that long ago, maybe 10, 15 years ago, that the people that find their way into my world, you know, you were asking about the ASA courses and all that. Uh -huh. They're anxious. They're eager to learn. And they'd come sailing with me. you got to schedule it way in advance. costs a bunch of money. And the people really want to be there. They don't care if they sleep in the pilot berths. And almost all of them have, are people, for whatever you define success as, have been making really good decisions and have been successful in their life. Yeah. And when they get on a boat, they, they just don't stop doing that. They may not have great sailing skills or great sailing experience, but they all have good thinking and critical thinking skills. And so it's super... My world is easy once I realized I didn't have to be the guy with all the answers. Mm. Um, and that as a right. captain, you know, I used to poo poo this whole leadership stuff, thinking, ah, oh, that's something they do in corporate meetings. Mm -hmm. But now I realize that I'm a pretty good leader because I'm good at figuring out what people are good at. You, and I guess, touched on a question I had there <laughs> is that do you have a, uh, a process for measuring? Uh, Measuring crew, uh, you know, you, you deal with a lot of different skill levels, a lot of different um, personality types, a lot of different appetites for risk and and, and stress in some some stressful circumstances, mm -hmm. and, and so that's going to bring out the best and worst in people. So it's a really interesting question, and the way I do it is a little, maybe just a, a little offbeat in that I I don't put that much stock in your resume. Um, Fair enough, yeah. and. What I, but I'm very much into human-to-human -human relationships. And so I always want people to get to the boat the night before. Mm -hmm. I want to kind of see them and talk to them and have them tell me jokes and laugh with them. And then, then we shove off on a passage. And before you know, we get going, we get the boat set up, even if people aren't great sailors, and then we sit down and chat. And I do about a three-hour safety briefing. Which sucks all the fun out of what they thought they were going to do. Then suddenly they're <laughs> terrified. But during that process, I learn a whole lot about people. And over the course of what's now been 24 hours, I have a really good instinct about folks. And can I'm, I ask them a lot of questions in a, in a personal, friendly way. And then so you know what your job will be in an in, in emergency. And I'll know who's going to be a good communicator. Okay. And sometimes I get it wrong, but at this stage of the game, I've, I'm really zoomed in on it. And off, I suppose off the back of that would be a good time is, um, to ask the question, do you have, so obviously in 300,000 miles and all these crews and all these <laughs> boats, there's been some, there's been some days. Um, do you have a process or a mental model or a, a mantra or a... Or gypsy witchcraft or, or whatever um, that you use to manage your personal stress and keep a cool head when it's all going to custom? Hmm. It's a great question. Um, I don't think it's a system as much as it's been an evolution. And I sort of do observe myself in it when, yeah, we've had some trying moments. We've, you know, we had a woman really come close to being washed overboard. And it was a tremendous wave that just took its all. It's part of the sequence in my book, Serious Ocean. And and I really felt like she was gonna go and, you know, and, and but I never, f I don't know, it, it's, it's you just kind of hardened, I think, by the miles. I don't feel, I've, I, when the situation really gets serious i find myself getting energized and mm -hmm. and not that i'm some i mean i make so many mistakes i i'm not i mean i'm a poet not a mechanic and i, I mean i'm rather you know read a novel than read how to fix something but i find that the 
power of an emergency really brings out the best in me, not the worst in me. Thank goodness. And so I think that tends to really help others on board. Mm -hmm. So if the captain, so-called captain, is really freaking out and screaming, Mm. then I think things devolve quickly. I mean, I would say the vast majority of my trips go by and no voice is raised. And I really like that. I mean, yeah. there's discussion. I mean, sometimes like now, now, now. You know, we're speaking yeah. with one voice now. Now, 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 now. Okay, this is it. Boom, let's do this. But it's not like, hey, come on, come on, yeah. come on. I, yeah. I think the screaming really sort of sucks the energy the wrong way. And so I try really hard, but it's it's not even becoming... I used to, as a young person, I remember Ty and I having some huge arguments rounding the horn. But... Now I've seen a lot of it before. I have a good sense of how dangerous it really is. Mm -hmm. And when the crew see me in this super high alert mode, Mm -hmm. they realize, man, let's, this is serious. So what's your, your trickle down model, if you will. So it's obviously something's happened All right. and there's a figure out what it is. Okay. Right. First thing that goes through your head, what is it? it? It's, um, so first thing that goes through my head is immediately to figure out why I don't need that anymore. <laughs> Seriously. And so yeah, that's all, I guess so that's, I, I want to know yeah, yeah. that, okay, yeah. we have rudder issues, right? <laughs> okay, I'm going to probably be able to fix it, but I want to know in my brain, yep. it's why I bought that hydrovane. Yeah. Because I, the hydrovane could steer us home without a rudder. Mm-hmm. Um, so I immediately very quickly think, okay, well, the manual bilge pump is fine. The bump, you know, I can, excuse me, divert the intake on the diesel to be a pump if I need to. So I, I think of ways that I can mitigate. If this is a disaster I can't fix, I can mitigate it. Yeah. And secondly, what I've realized really quickly is that point of sale has a lot to do with everything. So I would, and you raised that point the other night, yeah. Yeah, yeah so yeah, it if occurred to me. you know if you're both if you're going to windward, right, and you're mm-hmm. beating along, and there was no water in the bilge when you left the harbor, and then an hour later you look below, there's a foot of water in the boat. It's almost a hundred percent that the leak's coming from the low side. Mm-hmm. So the very you know the very first move is not to run below and shut through hulls and all that. The very first move is to tack violently to the other side and lift the leak. A leak close to the water or above the water is so much different than one three feet below. Now you've just bought time. And so I try to think in terms of, okay, we didn't have a collision. So what would go through my mind? We didn't have a collision. It's not catastrophic. We're in good shape. We do have a life raft if we need it. But water is now flooding in. I know it's coming from the low side. What I need right now is a little bit of time and not to be wading through knee-deep water. So let's get on the other tack. Mm -hmm. And now I'll work and I'll check and I'll th- shut off all the valves and invariably you find it some stupid thing. Mm-hmm. But so, quick thinking in that respect. And But before that time, everybody knows who's sailing. And even if Taji and I are just doing a passage on our own, what our jobs are. Yeah, She's a radio person. You know, I want her to make sure the ditch bag's in the cockpit. Um, I'll, if, if it comes to it, I need to be able to be the one who jumps the life raft overboard. But these things are, we're not going to be discussing them at that point. Yeah. So that pre-planning and then just kind of thinking on your feet, but in the right way. Do you ever find you have to get a lid on yourself? Is there ever been a time where you've had to, so that I, there's, there's been, a, I mean, I've dealt with it prior to leaving. There's anxiety. If mm. there's a cascading level of failure, you fix one a, thing, there's a yeah. series of, anxiety. and when the, when it hits the fan and it's time to go to work, bef- just that moment before you settle into the, mm. um, so I'm I'm like well, a, for sure there, no to say that there isn't this like yeah this, this that's fear in the back just of your before throat. you oh, yeah. you get a muzzle on yourself and yeah. you're like go to work definitely yeah how do you how do you get yourself get a muzzle on yourself so it's interesting you know I think Adam it's easier to do that when you have like paying crew I think I so. For me, I feel like going to sea a lot of times is my job. Mm -hmm. Um, As opposed to when we're just cruising, it's easier for me to get out of sync that way. So, you know, people say, oh, it must be a pain having five or six people on your boat. To some degree it is, but in many ways it's great because I feel like I'm working. Mm. So I'm kind of in that mindset. Keep you in the zones. It's just Taji and I, and then things start to cascade. 
I really find myself I mean to kind of focus more yeah. than if so I think like what you guys are doing and what cruisers are doing sometimes is more challenging I've got people who who I can direct and who want to help and are enormously talented and I mean I always have these engineers aboard and they're just solving problems all the time <laughs> you know I love having engineers aboard because I'll say I bet there's no way we could fix that. What? Are you kidding? We can fix that. Bring it on. <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> and you know that drill. Yeah. So anyway, that's, it's, I think cruising, the, the, the interpersonal relationships are even more challenging than with what I do. Mm. My authority is kind of, you know, sort of there because they accept it when they sign aboard. Mm. Cruising, you have got this constant dynamic. And so... Your reviews, the reviews of your... You wouldn't be, you wouldn't continue to be doing what you're doing and had such a successful career if you weren't a very good captain. Mm. And it's apparent now. So I guess as a, as a total novice captain now, um, what would you say would be some of the essential traits of a good captain? Mm. Um, things to aspire towards or, or perhaps anyone who's influenced your yeah. performance or, or skill set? So... I think really key traits to being a good captain, and they often surprise people, is number one is sharing the power. And because you can't do it all. And the, so sometimes people will say to me, boy, I bet you sleep with one ear open. Nothing could be further from the truth. You have to come <laughs> whack me with a winch handle because when I sleep, I sleep knowing that I'm going to need that rest in a big way because when I need to perform, if things really go wacky, I need to have rested. Nothing's worse than a captain who never sleeps, who kind of lets the boat become the obsession. So a really well-managed passage is when there's good food, everybody's hydrated, people are kind of happy, they're confident, they're sleeping, they're eating, they're using the toilet regularly. So I haven't mentioned anything about sales trimmed or whatever. Mm -hmm. So when you get the world rocking just right, you are sailing much better. And to me, that's in a kind of mushy, soft way. The definition of a good captain is not someone who's out there just to only concerned about the sailing. Yeah. Because the sailing, truthfully, is the easy part. The thing about crossing oceans, it's the whole package. And when you reach a place, this is the magic, man. When you reach a place where your life and your body feels as good as it does on land, mm. at sea, it's crazy. The world just opens yeah. up and yeah. you see things and you feel things and you write poetry and you, you feel wonderful. And that's the definition of a good captain to help people find that state. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, that's so like a really soft about, answer. No, no, you no, wanna, no. So it's all yeah. about, for you, it's, well, in general, I think, I think you're right, it's about the the, the captain's job is the crew. The yeah. crew's job is the boat. Yeah, and yeah, and that cascades down from there. I think that's a really good way of putting it. And I because okay. I think the crew doesn't yet know how to deal with the other crew, and mm. the crew wants to deal with the boat. And so if it's it's just you and Kiara, you know, obviously it's hard to pull that dynamic together. It's easy for me. Kiara's got a <laughs> heap of work to do. But I just have to keep, <laughs> keep her happy. Pretty much for me, it's happy wife, happy life, really. <laughs> <laughs> the universal creed, brother. <laughs> yeah, she's gonna have a hard time with all the plumbing. Uh, <laughs> all the plumbing. <laughs> Head's broken again. <laughs> so, do do you feel within those within those skill sets? I guess. Do you feel that there's anything that you have to strive towards, or is there anything that you remind, like, oh, keep yeah. yourself in check, or remind yeah. yourself of, or? Yeah, and know, it's interesting as I get older. That, you have said that, or whatever well, it might be. Yeah, I know sometimes that. So these are interesting times we live in. <laughs> mm. And virus aside, there's been a lot of... Um, it seems like people are sort of divided in their political beliefs. And there are people who are really religious and some that are non-religious. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And so you can really get yourself in shaky ground. And that's not fair to people. Um, so... What happens invariably is nobody talks about it to begin with. And then the crews on, on our passage, they really come together. And again, maybe this is Penn Glossian and, and, and I sort of am lucky the people who join me, but we have kind of what we're missing in the world on Quetzal. We have these pretty civil discussions. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, oh, don't talk about politics. But when we do talk about it, we're respectful. And if yeah. you're just kind of like a 
complete ass about it, then then we don't carry on, and nobody wants that. Yeah. But civil discourse is like sort of the nature it's of the being path on a sale. to enlightenment. It's that's the how path. you. <laughs> it is. That's how you solve problems. You uh, have to do, without debate. There's no. For sure. There's no eureka moment. That's and you know, Taji will point. sometimes laugh because I'll say, "Oh, I had this amazing person on my last trip. He's a." You know, he's a philosophy professor. Or I had this guy, you know, who was a super hardcore conservative. And we talked about William F. Buckley's writings and how beautiful they were. I mean, we crossed paths on so many things. And it's made me, it just has enhanced my tolerance and kind of respect for people in general. The, the people who are sort of jerks, they stick out like a sore thumb on a boat. Mm. And they rarely come. I'm lucky with that. They they almost never come because I, maybe that's just not who I attract. Luckily, but the people who do come, they just can't do enough and are careful with their opinions. I mean, this we had a great discussions. Taylor, the doctor's wife, on this last trip. Our political views were very different, but he's very very smart mm -hmm. and taught me a lot of different things about the electoral college I didn't know and really interesting. And these were, I, I just cherish those discussions. So, I don't know. I think that it's it's the whole parameter. Sailing is the great equalizer. Hey, guys. Thank you for watching that. If you got all the way through it, mega points for you. Well done. That was a mammoth. And guess what? There's more to come. Uh, I had to cut it in half because of the vastness of the subjects that we discussed. And so... Next week, or perhaps the week after, we will revisit the second half of this discussion uh, in a more blue water boats discussion context. Um, so stand by for that. Please let us know in the comments if you enjoyed it, if you have any thoughts, if you have any questions for John, I can forward them to him. Uh, and if you feel that I should pursue more of this kind of thing, I had a great time doing it, and I feel that perhaps I could rustle up some more pillars of the sailing community to um, interrogate. And, uh, and subject to the same level of questioning. So do let me know below how you feel about it, and uh, thank you for watching.